Hi everyone, and welcome to our overview of Chapter 2, Children, Families, and State. Nearly 4,000 years ago, in one of the earliest known codes of law, Babylonian king Hammurabi recognized that the purpose of the law was to bring the rule of righteousness to the land, so that those that were stronger and less moral could not harm those that were weaker and more vulnerable. Children are an especially vulnerable group that must be rigorously protected by the law. The 1924 Geneva Declaration of the Rights of the Child recognized that the child, by reason of his physical and mental immaturity, needs special safeguards and care, including appropriate legal protections. Among the rights that must be protected, the 1990 United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child recognized a child's inherent rights to life, liberty, fundamental equality, essentials for survival and human dignity, education, a name, a nationality, family relationships where possible, rights to freedoms of expression, conscience, and religion, and protections from violence, maltreatment, exploitation, neglect, and abuse, including sexual abuse. While respecting legitimate family privacy and parental authority, there is a collective social responsibility to protect children and provide necessary services in the best interest of the child. The first right and responsibility to care for and protect the child resides with parents or other legal guardians. If parents fail in these obligations, however, centuries-old common law recognizes an obligation for the common government to assume these obligations under the parents' patria doctrine. The parents' patria doctrine holds that while rights and responsibility concerning the child are first vested in the parents, the common government also has a right to intervene when parents fail in their responsibilities to the child. Parents may also delegate some of their parental authority to school officials or others under the loco parentis doctrine. Under this legal doctrine, school officials may exercise reasonable quasi-parental authority while the child is in the care and custody of school officials, subject to the limits of the law and guided by the best interests of the child. When acting in loco parentis, school officials have a duty to supervise and protect children as a reasonable parent would under the circumstances and children have a duty to follow the reasonable orders of school officials, just as they must follow reasonable orders from their parents for their own good and safety. Children necessarily rely on the protection of adults, both at home and in school. It is therefore the responsibility of adults to assure that homes and schools provide a safe haven for children. Educators must protect the safety and well-being of students in schools so that the students may focus their full attention on learning and growing into well-adjusted, responsible, productive citizens through their studies and healthy social interactions in schools. In Chapter 2, we will learn about children's rights as they mature from infancy to adulthood, parental rights and responsibilities, child protective services, and the necessary balance of doing enough to protect children without doing too much and unlawfully intruding on parental rights and family privacy, mandatory reporting statutes for suspected abuse or neglect of children, essential principles of juvenile law, including lawful questioning of students by school officials or police, child custody, lawful access to student records, compulsory school attendance laws, including the lawful regulation of private and homeschool programs, and children's freedom of conscience and the limits of state authority. As you read Chapter 2, please keep in mind that this chapter is about protecting children, protecting families, and protecting yourself professionally. <clears throat> First, concerning protecting children. Learn to recognize the signs of child abuse and neglect, and teach your colleagues and other adults to recognize clear signs that children may need help. In most cases of abuse and neglect, physical and behavioral signs are present and discernible to a trained observer. If there is a pattern of signs of abuse or neglect, or any serious sign that cannot be reasonably dismissed as benign under the circumstances, a prompt report and appropriate professional intervention are warranted to protect the child. Second, protecting uh, the family. Willful and intentional abuse or neglect of children must be dealt with appropriately, including removal of the child from the home and filing criminal charges where warranted. Do not, however, assume that all child neglect is willful. Sometimes otherwise caring parents are simply overwhelmed by financial problems, health problems, or other problems, and they are in need of services themselves. 
With appropriate assistance and support, the parent may be able to improve child care standards to healthy levels for children. If it is possible to safely allow the child to remain with a parent who loves the child and is capable of providing appropriate care with necessary assistance, preserving the child's family is a priority both legally and ethically. And finally, protecting yourself. Fail failure to report suspected child abuse and neglect is a crime in all 50 states. If you must report suspected abuse, also appropriately document your report, including the facts and circumstances you reported, who you reported to, the date of your report, and any other relevant information. Most administrators will promptly and responsibly forward and follow up on your report. But be warned, someone who is unethical enough not to forward your report to the proper authorities is probably also unethical enough to claim that you never made the report if they are threatened with criminal charges for failing to forward your report. Documentation of your report provides you with protections from any future false claims that you fail to report. Keep your documentation confidential and in a safe location. Also, be very cautious about getting overly involved in any domestic disputes between warring parents, children and parents, etc. These disputes can become highly emotional, volatile, and even dangerous. If family members have lost their abilities to remain calm and rational, an appropriate professional distance is called for, both physically and emotionally. And if there are any threats or any other serious signs of danger, notify law enforcement authorities to protect children, yourself, and others. I hope that Chapter 2, Children, Families, and the State, will engage you as an active participant in promoting child welfare, keeping our children safe, and improving working relationships among children, families, and school officials. Very best wishes to all.